afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Well, uh, my name is Adam Lambert. Most of you uh, may know me as Actors Attorney. And we're here today to talk a little bit about uh, campus law. Uh, we're going to talk about some recent developments uh, in the law and some things that you need to know about. All right, we'll start with uh, some current events. Uh, these are all things that have happened in the last uh, six months. First, on March 7th, 2013, two weeks ago, President Obama signed the 2013 Violence Against Women Act, which amends what other act? Now, anybody that went to my lecture earlier today would know this. What is it? Larry Act. Larry Act. That is correct. Uh, it added several uh, new uh, classifications to the Clary Act. Uh, again, we talked about it uh, at length this afternoon, so I don't want to go into it too much. Uh, on March 19, 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court rendered a decision in Kurtzang v. John Wiley and Sons. The court held in that case. I'm not surprised you don't know it. This uh, is not uh, something you deal with every day, but it's something you'll probably be seeing a little bit. It doesn't deal directly with your job, so you'll be seeing it on campus. The first use, use doctrine uh, applies to copyrighted works, specifically in this case, textbooks manufactured overseas and brought into the U.S. Uh, it's just sort of an interesting case, and you might be uh, seeing uh, a little bit of it with your students. Uh, the case, Mr. Kurtzang was a, uh, an exchange student from India. He came over to the United States. Knowing what his course schedule was going to be, he bought textbooks from India. I did not know this, but uh, U.S. manufacturers of textbooks, U.S. manufacturers of everything, uh, often <coughs> license the rights to manufacture these goods overseas. And the agreement they have with these manufacturers overseas is you can manufacture it and you can sell it, but you can't bring it into the U.S. and sell it. Uh, in this case, John Wiley and Sons uh, had a wholly owned subsidiary that was selling their textbooks, creating them overseas and selling them overseas. Mr. Kurtzang discovered that he could buy the same textbooks that they were selling here in the U.S. for less than half the price if he bought them overseas. He was having his friends overseas buy the books. He was importing them here and reselling them for less than they were being sold for in the bookstore. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court said perfectly legal. He was buying them overseas. It was a legal retail sale. Uh, and he, as the owner, was allowed to bring it in and sell it and resell it if he wanted to. So it's something you may just start seeing a little bit of. All right, question. Which campus had to be shut down within the last six months due to terrorist threats or violence? Any guess? All of them. All of the above. That's just within the last six months. As a matter of fact, all of them except LSU were within the last three months. Uh, the good news, there is a little bit of good news. I mean, the bad news is, is that violence on campus is spreading and it's becoming epidemic. The good news is the emergency notification systems at every one of these schools work and probably save some people's lives. True or false? This year, a professor at a Christian university was fired for being unmarried and pregnant. The school then gave her job to the father of her unborn child. True or false? Absolutely true. This just happened. This just happened. Uh, March 2013, this month, Terry James was fired from a Christian college for quote sexually immoral behavior, including premarital sex. When the school hired the father of her child, then she filed suit. Question: Was it legal for the school to fire her in the first place for having premarital sex? Absolutely, that's exactly correct. It's a private school, it's specifically a Christian school. It's not a secular private school, it's a Christian school. They do have the right, Christian schools or schools that are, that are based on any religion, do have the right to fire people based on violations of what they consider to be their faith. However, they still have to follow federal law, and federal law says what's good for the goose is good for the gander. So you can't then hire a man for a job that you just fired a woman for. You know, as, as an attorney, I, I have to say, why don't I ever get cases that easy? <laughs> <laughs> if it was another man other than the baby's father. Correct. It wouldn't matter who it was, but I mean, what kind of a bonehead would hire <laughs> the father of the same child? Yes, ma'am. Question. Wouldn't that also affect their ability to use 
federal financial aid funds because they weren't following federal law? You, now, by doing which one? By firing her or by hiring the husband? Either one. No, they can. No, because they it's can't. Discriminatory person. They can fire. They can't. They they can fire anybody. It's only discriminatory because they then hired the man. If they would have refused to hire a man that had premarital sex, it's not discriminatory. You see what I'm saying? So that's where they broke the law, by hiring the father of her, of her child. And it did not necessarily didn't have to be the father, it was in this case. But if they would have hired any man that they knew was having premarital sex, they're in the same. He was just really off. Exactly. <laughs> did they, know, did they know it was the father of her child? That I don't know. Uh, it was, I'm not really well, sure. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they soon so found out. <laughs> now, here's one that, that you might find interesting. Uh, how many community college people do we have here? All right. As of 2013, on average, community college graduates right out of school earn more than graduates of four-year institutions. True or false? True. Yes. It is actually true. And this was, this was a... This was a uh, report from Georgetown University Center on Education and the Workforce, which, ju which just came out in February of this year. Uh, it said, on average, <coughs> many uh, community college graduates earn more than four-year uh, degree students. All right, in 2013, a Utah college canceled a play based on the music of Elvis Presley because a parent believed that the music was obscene. True or false? <laughs> This one's false, but the only reason it's false is that it was a high school. <coughs> but believe it or not, in 2013, somebody found the music of Elvis Presley to be obscene. Uh, they actually did cancel the performance uh, until somebody stepped in and rewrote the play and rewrote the music, and the Utah version was actually performed. Uh, so censorship is still alive and well in some parts of our great nation. All right, part two, copyright. Uh, True or false? If I buy a DVD, I own that DVD and I can do what, can show it wherever and whenever I want. Absolutely, everybody got that right. It's great. Uh, when you purchase or rent a DVD or a copy of any work, you only own the copy. You do not own the rights to show that publicly, obviously. Okay. If I don't charge admission or make money off of a public showing of a DVD, uh, or any work, then I'm not violating cop copyright law. False. Absolutely, that is false as well. Whether you make money or not can be an issue uh, for the court when it comes to assessing damages, but it doesn't mean that you didn't violate the law. If something is posted on the internet, it's in the public domain False. and I'm free to display it publicly. False. Now, I don't know, I read this on the internet, and everything you read on the internet is true. It's true. <laughs> that is absolutely false as well. Uh, and, and, and this is this is the second one is a question that actually does come up a lot. I've had people ask me, well, what if the artist himself put it on the internet? Even if the artist himself puts it on the internet and allows you to view it as many times as you want, it still doesn't mean that it doesn't have copyright protection. Okay? All right, since we are a school, I hear this one a lot. We're a school, so we can publicly display movies and music under the fair use exceptions. That's exactly right. That is false. And that's exactly what the fair use exception means. Usually the fair use exception only deals with excerpts. It is there to protect a professor's right to critique the work and talk about the work, but it's not there to destroy the commercial value of the work. In general, if the, the commercial value of a work is destroyed by your displaying it, in other words, if I don't need to then go out and see the movie or listen, you know, buy the CD because I've already seen it or I've already heard it, then you're probably violating copyright law. Which of the following are not subject to copyright law and may be publicly displayed without paying royalties? Any guesses? D. D, both A and C, that's correct. Anything that's in the public domain and anything created by the U.S. government. Um, the second one I'll take first. Anything created by the U.S. government. 
Obviously, you're not going to find any great movies or music there. <laughs> uh, but you can often find some good things there. You can find some good scholarly works there. Uh, you can treat them all as if they were white papers, things of that nature. You can, all, you can find some really great photographs, Hubble, NASA, things like that. Uh, anything that's ever put out by the U.S. government is not subject to copyright. So you can take it, like if you go to, say, the Department of Education's website, and you see some slides up there that you like, and you want to do some, you know, you want to take those slides and bring them back to your school. Perfectly welcome to do that, because if the U.S. government puts it out, it is not subject to copyright. You can use it as often and as freely as you like. Going into public domain, I'm sorry, you had a question? Yeah, quick, quick answer, what is white paper? A white paper just means you can use something as freely as you like. It, it, it it's essentially means it's in the public domain. Um, the public domain. Let's talk specifically about movies because we have some uh, people from here, uh, here from Criterion that probably come up and say hello to you. Uh, you're not going to find Gone with the Wind or the last Oscar movie in the public domain. Uh, I will tell you what's in the public domain. Anything created before 1923, which doesn't give us a whole lot to work with. <laughs> um, now there are some, there are a few works that were created between 1923 and 1963, which are in the public domain. Because during that period of time, an author or whoever owned a copyright had to renew it. And if you didn't renew it, it fell into the public domain. I will tell you though, especially when you're dealing with things like movies and music, Anything that made money, trust me, was renewed. So if it was popular, if it's something anybody wants to see, then it, it, even if it was created during that time, I can guarantee you it was, it was renewed and it's still copyright. So how do we show movies and uh, things like that without violating copyright? I think you all got the yellow sheet of paper from Criterion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Criterion Pictures. This is Carrie. <laughs> Pleasure meeting with a number of you, and I look forward to meeting with all of you. Um, we are non theatrical licensors for 20th Century Fox and Paramount Pictures, um, and we are definitely looking to provide inexpensive and accessible ways for you to show movies on campus. If you're showing them currently and uh, would like to show more, that's something we want to go ahead and provide. We're looking at a, a basic 20% discount across the board for anyone who's been attending the, the campus um, activities convention. As well, um, we're happy to work with different groups on campus in order to provide, let's say, educational-based screenings so that maybe some of that other funding can be released by, let's say, the History Department, the Women's Studies Department, the, uh, the, the um, Hispanic Studies Department, etc. We have films that will fit all of that, and um, we help you go through the minefields of public performance licensing and um, any questions with regards to that. All right, let's move on. Uh, part three: contracts and writers. The basic elements of any contract are what? All right, I'll tell you, it's, it's easy, all of the above, but I want to go through them. Don't hit here, so I want to go through them all. Let's go through them for a minute, okay? These are, these are the four elements of any contract. Uh, this is Contracts 101 when you get to law school. These are the four elements of every contract that's ever existed. Offer, acceptance, consideration, and intent. I'll take the last two first because you're unlikely to ever have to deal with those as an issue. Um, consideration for your purposes just means money, that money changed hands. Have you ever seen one of these contracts where somebody says, for such and such, for the consideration of one dollar, I give such and such to so and so? Why do, they, why do they always put that dollar in there? Because without um, money exchanging hands, it's, there is no consideration. In other words, if I'm giving you something and you're paying me for it, then I'm getting consideration of money, you're getting consideration of whatever product or service I'm giving you. So without the money, there is no consideration. So for your contracts, there will always be consideration because there's always money gonna, that's going to be involved in these contracts. Intent, you'll never have an issue with intent. That basically just means that both people intended to form a contract. You can't accidentally form a contract. But now the first two, offer and acceptance. 
Offered acceptance are pretty simple, but you'll see that they can get a little bit sticky. An offer just means I offer to sell you something, I or offer to, to, to sell you a service or a product. If I tell you I want to sell you a baseball for five dollars, I offer you that baseball for five dollars. Acceptance is sure, I'll pay you five dollars for that baseball. You have offer, acceptance, consideration, intent, there's a contract. Okay? If a party accepts an offer but adds additional terms that were not contemplated in the original offer, that is what? And this is where it starts getting a little sticky sometimes. And I'll give you an example. If I tell you, I'll sell you a baseball for $5, and you say, you got a deal. I'll buy your baseball and baseball bat for $5. Well, now you have the bat in there. So what is that? Is that a valid acceptance? Is it an acceptance only if the accepting party signs it? No, it's a counteroffer. So what, the, what does that mean? That means we're still negotiating. It's not actually an acceptance of the original deal. Okay? <coughs> True or false? We're going to talk a little bit about riders. But before I ask the question, uh, what is a rider? If the addition of these additional terms means that we're still negotiating, what is a rider? Isn't a rider additional terms? I mean, you make a deal with an artist through their agent, and then you get this rider, and this rider says, these are, the, these are our additional demands we have to, that you have to meet. Aren't those additional terms? So do you still have a contract there? Yes, you do. Because there are additional terms that were contemplated in the original offer. Because, and so why do we use riders first? Let's back up and ask why we use them. We use riders because it's easy for, especially when you're dealing with an agent. The agent may not know all of the exact requirements for every band he has, every artist he has, every lecturer he has. So it's a way for you to come to a basic agreement, leaving some things that you both contemplated out to be decided later or to be you know, handled later, to say, all right, I know that I'm gonna, I want this band, I don't know what their exact requirements are, but you're gonna send them to me, yeah, I'll send them to you, and those are gonna become part of the contract, okay? If they can't be met, it's, it's, it's not necessarily voided. It's one of the reasons you have to, you have to be as specific as possible. It's always best if you see a rider before you even sign a contract. Sometimes it's not possible. If you can, one of the ways you can protect yourself against, and we'll see, there are some outrageous ones out there. Luckily, we don't usually have that problem with people here at AFCA, but some celebrities have some really outrageous ones. One of the ways you can protect yourself is talk to the agent before you sign. Make sure you can even put it in the contract. Make sure that you can at least set out parameters. You know, uh, We will pay for lodging up to X amount of dollars. We will pay for meals up to X amount of dollars, things of that nature, if, if it's an issue. Thankfully, of all the times that I've been representing AFCA, we've only once ever had a rider, serious rider problem that really became an issue. Uh, there are certainly bumps in the roads here and there, but usually it's not that big of an issue. Uh, well, what about this one? Anybody that's old enough to remember the 1980s? Just, uh, <laughs> in the 1980s, Van Halen had a contract rider that specified that the venue had to provide M&M's backstage for the band with all of the brown M&M's removed. True or false? That's absolutely true. And as a matter of fact, when they were playing, when they played Colorado State and Pueblo, David Lee Roth found brown M&M's in his bowl and went on a tirade and destroyed the green room, causing $85,000 worth of damage. His defense was he only believes it was $12,000 worth of damage. Wow. wow. All right. Let's let's do some divalicious looking. Who is the most diva-ish diva in the world? Jennifer Lopez. Match the celebrity with his or her rider demands. All right. Let's, let's do Britney Spears first. What do you think Britney Spears' rider demand is? An electric shaver. Please escort me so we can It's C. She needs a phone in her dressing room. However, if the phone rings, it'll be a $5,000 fine. 
Um, she also needs McDonald's hamburgers with no buns and a framed photograph of Princess Diana. Go figure. Christina Aguilera. Any guesses which one is hers? D. She, she needs a police escort so that she doesn't have to wait in traffic to get to the venue. She needs soy cheese and Oreos. I'm not one to talk, but I think Christina needs to lay off the Oreos. <laughs> All right, MIA, what about them? A or B? B. B it is. Three dancers, specifically they need three dancers between the ages of 20 and 25 in full body burgers. My first question is, how do you know how old they are if they're in full body burgers? <laughs> but that's their demand. Kanye West, or as my mother calls him, Kane. What's the guy? He it is. A chauffeur who must be wearing only 100% cotton, no man-made fibers anywhere. What? What? I don't even want to ask that <laughs> question. <laughs> and the most diva-ish diva has got to be Jennifer Lopez. This is what was in her rider. A 40-foot trailer, all white inside, with all white flowers, tablecloths, drapery, couches, and candles. The list actually went on for quite some time. And by the way, this rider was from an AIDS benefit. That's what she demanded when she played a benefit. I'd hate to see what she demands when she's playing a concert for money. I this because I've seen it because she's part of the Miami Dolphins. The entire suite had to be like that. Really? I was kind of laughing at it. And I saw it, I was like, oh my God. He said, he said in Miami, he, he worked for, uh, for her show in Miami, and it was exactly the same. Wow. All right, let's go on to the next one. All right, let's talk a little bit about insurance. <clears throat> um, before we go on to the question, let me uh, just talk a little bit about insurance. Um, if you have a novelty act, uh, any act where people have to perform things where they could, where there's a, a decent risk they could get injured, that act should have insurance. Your school should be named as an additional insured on, insured on that policy. Okay. Now, I have seen some schools that have sort of taken that a little bit too far, and they require every single act that comes to campus. I will tell you that if you have a slam poet or a lecturer, they really don't need to have insurance <laughs> because nobody's going to get injured by a slam poet talking. Okay? Um, but if you, do, if you have a novelty act, and again, a novelty act where there's a decent risk of people getting injured, you should not only confirm that they have insurance, but confirm that that insurance comes in the amount of at least a million dollars and that the school is listed as an additional insured. So what's the best way to find out if the school is listed and they have the correct insurance? Any, any? Everybody says A? It's C. It is actually C. Uh, and that's all you have to do. It's pretty simple. Uh, ask for what's called the declarations page. Sometimes it's called a deck page for short. It's a very standard term in the industry. Any agent is going to know what it means. Just tell them you want to see fax over a copy of your deck page. They'll have their insurance agent fax it over to you. Make sure that it has the insurance amounts, and your school should be listed. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. If an attraction that we book brings a crew to campus, we should only deal with the person in charge and not the crew directly. True or false? It is true, and the reason it's true is that there are some cases, and they're rare, but there still are some cases where if you hire an independent contractor, and that's what all of these acts are, when an act comes to your campus, they're an independent contractor. There are cases sometimes that hold that if you hire an independent contractor, and that independent contractor has employees that work for him, and you give direction and instruction repeatedly to their employees, their employees may become your employees. Uh, and like I said, it's rare, but it's possible. The, ba the safest thing to do to protect yourself in the school is when you get a crew that shows up to, to, to work a show or something, find out who's in charge, and that's who you deal with. Okay? All right, risk management. What is the number one thing that most colleges get sued over? Uh, 
Yeah, it's not sexy, but A is the correct answer. And it is by far head and shoulders above everything else. It's one thing that people hate talking about because it's boring. <laughs> but it is the number one thing that most schools get sued over. If you ever do, unfortunately, end up in litigation at your school, odds are better than not that the litigation may be over something like this, may be over a slip and fall or premises liability. So, I know everybody's looking at it now and saying, whoa, I, did not, I, I didn't even sign up for a final exam. I sure didn't sign up for mathematics. <laughs> for anybody that is mathematically inclined, we're going to talk a little bit about negligence. Does anybody know, and if you do know what this is, you can come up and start teaching. <laughs> Does anybody know what B is greater than PL uh, is known as? This is known as, believe it or not, the learned hand formula. The learned hand formula is named after a judge. His actual name was learned hand. Uh, he never sat in the Supreme Court. He, he was never appointed Supreme Court, but he actually did sit on the Supreme Court His several times. Was that was his real name, Learned Hand. Uh, and he was sort of an economist as well as an attorney. He liked, to, he liked to put things into mathematical formulas. For those of you that may be mathematically inclined, uh, it's a good little formula to use when you're, when you're assessing a situation. Let's do a, do a for, for example. You're getting ready to have a show on your campus. You find that there is some dangerous condition in the field. It's going to be out in the field. You find that there is a, an exposed pipe sticking five inches out of the ground. Okay? What this says is, if B is greater than PL, then you're not negligent for doing nothing. Okay? Now let, I'll tell you what they all mean. P means the probability of the loss, the probability of an accident happening. How probable is it? Now that could go up or down depending on what you have. Let's go back to the example of a pipe sticking out of the ground. If that pipe is in a high traffic area, the probability that somebody's going to injure themselves or trip over it is pretty high. If it's out in the woods, the probability is almost zero. It's very low. Okay? That's the probability. L is the loss, or the magnitude of the injury, the magnitude of the loss. What is the, if we go back to the same example, what's the likely injury? What's the likely loss going to be if somebody trips over that? sprained ankle, maybe a, it, it, at worst maybe a broken ankle or a broken wrist, okay? Maybe some cuts and bruises. Not extremely, extremely high on the scale. Nobody's certainly going to die most likely, okay? Now what's B? B is the burden, that, what it would cost you in other words to fix it. What would it cost you to fix it? And th there are different, you can go through different ideas and different things that you can do that will change that answer. For example, going back to the pipe, we could get rid of the problem altogether by cutting the pipe out, rerouting sewage, whatever it is that we have to do. That could cost thousands of dollars, right? So that may not be worth it because the cost is greater than the probability times the loss. So we probably don't have to do that. And if we don't do that, nobody can say we were negligent for not doing it. Everybody get it? Mm -hmm. Now there are some other ones though. You could say, well, maybe we could paint the thing bright yellow so at least people can see it. What does that cost? 50 cents worth of paint. Well, certainly that cost is less than the probability times the loss. So you should probably do something like that. What this basically tells you to do is when you have an event, think about premises liability. And that's all I'm really trying to get you to, to, to look at here. Think about premises liability. Go around. Look at the property. Make sure that everything's okay. Look for really serious problems. If you're having an event outdoors and you have a lot of electricity running through the stage, make sure you don't have any wires in puddles, things like that, because that can kill somebody. Okay? So look around and think about it. Very often, just the fact that you thought about it will help if, it, if anything bad ever happens. All right. At what age does a student become an adult under the law? Anybody? 18. 18 years old. Now, why did I ask you this question? Well, because, you know, we have a tendency, when I talk to uh, advisors, we have a tendency, and I do it myself, we have a tendency to talk about our students and call them our kids. They're kids, and we love to call them kids. And they are kids to us. 
Uh, but it's important to remember that these 18-year-old kids are adults, and they're adults in the eyes of the law, and they have the same rights as adults, and they have the same responsibilities as adults. And it's just something we should that we always have to keep in mind. Question, if a 19-year-old student violates school policy and the law by having alcohol or drugs on campus, we are allowed to inform his parents. False. That's actually 100% true. Normally it would be false under FERPA, correct? FERPA. FERPA has, that's, there are two reasons it's not. Well, one reason it, it probably is not, and one it definitely is not. FERPA has a specific example, or a specific exemption rather, for students who violate the law as it relates to alcohol or drugs. If a student who is under 21, the student must be under 21 at the time you report it to the parents, not under 21 at the time it occurred. So if a student's 20, violates the law, and then turns 21 before you inform his parents, you cannot inform his parents. Now FERPA does not require you to inform his parents at all, but you are allowed to inform his parents if he's under 21 at the time you inform him, okay? So you mentioned another exception, which we're actually going to talk a little bit about later, too, which is the dependency exception. The dependency exception is the exception that swallows the rule, as we'll see later. If alcohol is served at a school function and a student gets drunk and crashes into another car, the school is automatically liable because it served the alcohol to him. I know nowadays most campuses are dry. Uh, you know, I went to the I, I went undergrad at the University of New Orleans. We had a bar on campus. I mean, I'm not talking about a couple of Bud Lights in the commissary. We had a you know happy hour, highballs. We had a full fledged bar. And some schools do still serve alcohol. So is it true that if a school serves alcohol, they're going to be automatically liable if if, if a student gets drunk and gets on the wheel or something of that nature? It's actually false, because a school is going to have the same defenses that would be available to any bar, anybody that's serving alcohol, which means as long as, if, as long as they comply with state law, as long as they don't serve somebody that's underage, as long as they don't serve somebody that's obviously intoxicated, they're okay. If a student threatens me, this is one I've been hearing a lot of, unfortunately. If a student threatens me or another student, I can have the student removed from the campus before a hearing is even held. True. True or false? false. Absolutely true. And here's a very, very recent case. This is a case from 2010, O'Neill versus uh, Alamo Community College District. This is the court said it better than I could ever say it. They said. Students whose presence poses a continuing danger to persons or property or an ongoing threat of disrupt, disrupting the academic process may be immediately removed from the school. In such cases, the necessary notice and hearing should follow as soon as practical. I'll tell you a little bit about that case. There was a student, she got into a row with her professor because she didn't like the grade that her professor gave her. She appealed it. She lost the appeal. She then filed a lawsuit. In the lawsuit that she filed in the district court, she wrote, I am a veteran and I know how to handle automatic weapons. I also know how to handle explosives. And that professor didn't even know any of that. She said, I'm not a dangerous person and I'm not a violent person, but if I could shoot him dead within the bounds of the law and walk away penniless, I would do it. The next day, she was asked to never return to that school again. Now, they did have a hearing eventually. But the point of this is, if a student makes a threat to you, you are not powerless. Students can be removed if they pose an immediate danger to you, to another student, to anybody on campus. And with the rash of violence we've had, it's very important for you to know that. You don't have to wait until something bad happens. If you see something bad coming down the road, if you see the train coming down the tracks, derail it before it gets there if you can. Printing waivers of liability on the back of, uh, back of tickets saves me and my school from liability for any injuries that may occur during a bit. You know what I'm talking about? Have you ever bought a ticket, you look at the back, and they have, you can never sue us for anything. Nobody reads those things. I mean, for all I know, they may have the Constitution printed on the back of those tickets. Do those things save you from liability? 
usually false. They're almost never worth the, worth the paper they're written on. So why do you see them, though? Because it's not a bad idea. What I was told my clients is, any, any attorney worth his salt can probably get around that, that waiver. However, they can get around it. It certainly can't hurt. Let's talk a little bit about waivers. That type of waiver, that blanket ticket waiver, I'll call it, is probably the one that offers you the least protection. But it's still better than nothing. If you can, try and get a knowing waiver. When I say a knowing waiver, you tell, it's in writing, you tell a student, I'm going to participate in such and such event or such and such activity. I understand that this activity has a risk of injury. I hold the school harmless if I am injured doing this. Sign Joe Student. That's the best one you can get. You've explained it to them, it's in writing, they've signed it, everybody's great. Almost as good, but not as good, as posting the same sort of ticket blanket waiver, but posting it someplace conspicuously. Sort of like when you go to when you go to the amusement park and you must be at least this tall to ride this ride. You see signs where it says, you know, this activity uh, you know presents a risk of, of injury. Do it at your own risk. Okay. FERPA. When a student turns 18 years old or enters college at any age, the rights under FERPA transfer from the parents to the student. True or false? True. That's true. true. They still have the rights there, man. We're going to talk about that. Uh, true. Uh, while there are several exceptions, the general rule is that the student, it is the student's privacy rights we're guarding. Uh, the way, and, and the reason I tell you this is this is this is how you want to approach FERPA issues in general. Remember the reason for the law. The P stands for privacy. It's the student's privacy that we're really trying to protect. Not the school's privacy, by the way, the student's. Any document kept by a school or college that contains a student's name is a confidential education record under FERPA. True or false? That's actually false. And there was a very recent case. I didn't have time to actually put it into the slides because it, it, it was that recent, just a couple of days ago, um, where a professor actually uh, sent a public records request to his school because a student had written a bunch of emails about him. And he wanted to find out what that student wrote about him because it cost him his job. <laughs> the school refused. Well, they gave him the emails, but they redacted the student's name because they said it was an educational record, because it had the student's name in it. The court said no. A document doesn't become a student's educational record just because the student's in there, uh, just because his name is in there. Uh, it must, and they looked at this language, quote unquote, directly relate to an identifiable student. In other words, it must have something to do directly relating to that student. These emails, they said, related to the professor, not to the student. So the entire document was able to be turned over. Okay. True or false? A school may disclose records to the parents of an adult student without the student's consent if the student is a dependent for tax purposes. True. There you go. That's the one you've been waiting for. <laughs> this is the exception that swallows the rule. Um, Remember, it's the students' privacy rights that we're guarding here. These students are adults. So we have to have the student's permission to give out these records. This is an exception in the law, though. If Junior is a tax dependent and, file, and mom and dad file taxes every year and he's their tax dependent on their tax returns, they can look at whatever records they want without exception, even over Junior's strenuous objection. Okay? All right. Now, I know that Eric has been telling you all for, uh, for the last uh, three ed sessions, probably, that if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. So now it's time to play Stump the Lawyer if anybody has any questions for me. Uh, you got a question? Yes. On discrimination, mm -hmm. does the school have to several times. Caucasian this, you Caucasian that. Actually the word Caucasian, not white, not honky, Caucasian. Okay. She files a <coughs> discrimination grievance. 
Caucasian girl? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't see how. Uh, it's not an epithet. Um, you know, uh, pointing out somebody's, uh, you know, pointing out somebody's ethnicity is not, doesn't therein make it a racial epithet. Um, I mean, if they would have said a racial epithet, then it's, you're still not really talking, you're not really talking about discrimination either. What you're talking about is probably a violation of the speech code. Um, you know, a violation of the school's, of the school's rules. Oh, right. yeah. um, but I don't see how calling somebody Caucasian even violates any policy. Uh, but, you know, it does bring up one issue that I did want to touch on, uh, we touched on a little bit earlier, and that is, uh, you know, the issue of civility on campus, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I actually lecture on, on civility. I've given a lecture at a few schools on civility, and, uh, when, you know, in the process of researching it, it's just becoming a huge, huge problem. You know, students who, you know, don't, don't, you know, they can't have a discourse, they can't have discourse with, with other students or even their professors without yelling, without screaming. They don't know how to have a, a discussion without it becoming an argument. Uh, students that come late to class, students that text all, you know, constantly during class, students that just get up and walk out whenever they want. Uh, it's becoming a big issue. Um, and I've discovered, and what I think the general consensus is, and I agree that some of the problems, there are several problems, several reasons for the problem, and I think one of the big ones is um, there are a lot of students that are just coming unprepared to college. And it's becoming our job to sort of do remedial work with a lot of these students to get them to where they should have been when they got to us. Um, you know. It is, uh, and there's, you know, uh, some of it is just uh, a, a problem in, in, in general right now, you know, you know that, that Democrats hate Republicans now, and, you know, uh, you know people, people, instead of just disagreeing, they hate, you know, and, you know, Republicans hate Democrats, Democrats hate Republicans, Fox News people hate CNN people, it's just, you know, there's just, there, there's too much of this polarization in our society. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can do something about that. And I think uh, a lot of the things that you see here will help you with that, you know? Yes? Along the lines, uh, um, you know, you mentioned about the school not being liable for if they serve alcohol there, compliance with the law and everything. Um, for example, um, a Greek organization puts on a formal, um, and they use a third-party system. And they rent out, you know, a tavern, a local place. They do a third-party system, mm -hmm. totally in compliance with everything. Yep. And um, an alumnus, comes to the event, they get, you know, knee or whatever, leave, and they get an accident. Is that organization or the university liable for that person? Is that no. still fall under? Did they follow that? Correct. Yes, yeah, so and that's, yeah, that's the first, yeah, that's that purpose of the third party. Right, they follow the, they follow all the third party, yeah. they follow all of, all of the, uh, all, all the state statutes. Correct. No, they're not. Uh, I, it's, you know, that, that's why those laws are in place, you know. Uh, you have, you know, I also, you know, I have a brother that uh, owns a bar back in Louisiana, and, uh, and thankfully we've never had to deal with an issue like that, but I, you know, obviously know a little bit about the laws that relates to bars because, you know, it's my brother. <laughs> um, and when you serve alcohol, you are, you, you cannot serve somebody that's obviously intoxicated. Um, there is no law that actually requires you to, like, take somebody's keys, although most bars will. They'll at least try, you know. Most people will because it's just a common sense thing. But the law can't really mandate that. If somebody is hell-bent to get behind the wheel after having drinks, they're going to do it. And there's not a whole lot that, that we can do to stop them, and the law recognizes that. It's their choice to do that. It's not your choice, it's theirs. All right, well, thank you all very much. Oh, you got one more, I'm sorry. Yeah, I heard about movie Vatican for school library. You can show it. Yeah, if you get a movie from your school library, you can show it, not if it's copyrighted. You, can, you still can't publicly display it, not if it's copyrighted. doesn't matter how you got it, you can't publicly display it if it's copyrighted. Yes, but they wouldn't. I mean, what, what, you're, what you're getting from the library is, she, what she said is, you know, if they paid the, the, the royalty fees, then yeah, you could. Well, of course, you could. When you go rent a movie, like from uh, Criterion, uh, when you, if you go to them and rent a movie, what you're really paying for is not the DVD itself. You're paying for the license. Uh, your library has not paid for that license. 
what your library can do, and they do, is sort of similar to the textbook case we had. They own a copy, they're allowing you to borrow that copy, but with the person, just like you can let me, or you can loan to me a, co a copy of a DVD that you have, but I still can't show it publicly either. Okay. What about for educational purposes, like in the classroom, of just like a small... The educational exemptions can get a little fuzzy, but uh, generally, if, if it is a class that, that is set up for those purposes, uh, then you may fall under the, under the educational exemptions, but you still can't invite the rest of the campus. Right. What about film clubs? Um, you know, I'd have to actually, I, I would think I a film club may right. still fall under the exemption. I think you'd be okay, but I, honestly, I, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll research that for you. I've never actually researched that issue. Yeah, LSU. Yeah, if you uh, I'm represented. I guess I should say that I, I'm, I'm now represented. I'm represented by Coleman uh, Coleman Productions, and we're there in Hoover 53. If you want to come over and talk to me during one of the exhibit halls, if you want to email me, as I already told you, I'm always open to to help y'all to any questions you have. My email address is LSU Lawyer at AOL.com, or you can always contact Coleman Productions. They know how to get in touch with me. Uh, be, you know, feel free to send me an email. If there's an issue before you come to a conference. If there's an issue that you want to talk about, that you want me to discuss, that you want me to research for you, shoot me an email before the conference. I'll be happy to research that issue just for you, okay? All right, guys, thank you all very much. Thank you.